Так, уважаемые коллеги. Dear colleagues, we continue our work. Now we will change the sequence of our sessions. The sessions of surgical and therapeutic management will be in an hour. And now we will have the session on stomach diseases. And the first presentation will be made by Professor Tepesh. Uh, he will speak about uh, H. pylori gastritis, infectious disease, uh, how to treat. Professor Bordin, dear co-chair, dear colleagues, first of all, I would like to thank my uh, big friend for many, many years, Dmitry, for his kind invitation to be part of this EIGN postgraduate course. And the topic I was given was H. pylori gastritis, uh, infectious disease treat. So very straightforward direction. I agree with that. It is uh, the direction put uh, by Kyoto Consensus, but by Maastricht 5. So it's not very complicated to defend that title. H. pylori is a bacteria that lives with us on the earth for more than 60,000 years. So it had really a great long time to adapt to a stomach. And maybe in, in that history lies a part of the answer why we are not able to make a successful vaccine with which we can um, solve the problem of H. pylori infection. We are not there yet. Maybe we will never come there, but we will see. H. pylori is the most common infection in the world. So uh, almost uh, 60 plus percent of people on the earth uh, are infected. 4.4 uh, billion people, but the prevalence is very uh, different in different regions of the world, as it seen here on that picture. So it's the lowest in the high developed uh, states like Switzerland, like north of uh, Europe, but it's very high, almost 90% in underdeveloped part of the world. And so the approach to the disease and especially approach to screening and prevention could not be the same in each part of the world, but maybe that is for the discussion. Everybody uh, that is infected has active chronic gastritis, but 80% of those people that are infected are completely asymptomatic, maybe through whole uh, life uh, period. We received our infection in the childhood uh, in the majority of uh, primary infections, it is asymptomatic infection. And uh, only in, uh, let's say, 20% of cases, some serious disease can develop through the years or decades of our life. On one side, gastric cancer, 1 to 3%. Gastric ulcer, duodenal ulcer, or HP-associated dyspepsia, or idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura, to mention mild lymphoma here, you see uh, the pointer is, um, uh, is not working very good. So for me, mild lymphoma is very interesting because it was one of the first diseases uh, where in um, almost two-thirds of patients in Logano 1 or Logano 2 stage of the disease, you can cure the disease just with eradicating the H. pylori from the stomach. With the Kyoto Consensus uh, that was published three years ago, it was a first a clear statement that each patient with an infection has an infectious disease and should be treated if there are not serious contraindications to the use of the medication. And in the same way, Maastricht 5, one year later, pointed out that uh, H. pylori is uh, uh, gastritis, active gastritis, and, and is infectious disease and should be treated. In our recommendations, we put several group of patients in whom you, we, and I must search for the infection in asymptomatic population. Which are those groups? Patients that will embark on long-term therapy with salicylate or NSAIDs, patients that will embark on long-term therapy with PPI, patients from the gastric cancer families, and some patients with iron deficiency anemia without known cause, 
patients with idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura, some of them, of course, and patients with B12 uh, deficiency without any known cause. Which test to use to diagnose the infection? If patients come to us and we scope them, it's easy. We just need to take two biopsies for, uh, from antrum and corpus, and if they are positive, we should start treatment. If it's a great suspicion, endoscopical suspicion, and negative rapid urease test, we should use more tests, non-invasive tests, to prove the infection. That is especially the cause in patients with diffuse preneoplastic changes with atrophy and intestinal metaplasia, when we can, where we can have a high incidence of false negative biopsy tests. So in those patients, we use non-invasive tests. And uh, of course, to be sure to have accuracy in, in our diagnostic tests, there are two things we must be aware. At least uh, one month, patients should be off antibiotics, and uh, at least two weeks, patients should be off PPIs. But OK, we have some tests, and there are some studies, and uh, I took part of this, that with new test meals, maybe that two-week period can be shortened. And uh, we have also serology. I don't know how it's in Russia, but in Slovenia, maybe 15, 20 years ago, in primary care, they were using uh, serology, and I saw in one case report that you have presented also serology, IgG serology, as a test for proving the uh, cure of the infection. It's completely wrong, because serology can stay positive for many, many years when bacteria is not in the stomach. But we can use serology maybe in a group of patients like uh, those with uh, active bleeding, where biopsy and all the non-invasive tests can be false negative in 30%, and of course, we use serology for epidemiologic studies. What about eradication? We know nowadays that uh, not one therapy fits all, and you will see in the further uh, slides that in Europe, there are many different approaches for the first-line therapy, depends on the uh, local um, uh, local resistance of H. pylori to the antibiotics, and you must know your local resistance rate. But we know, what we know for sure, that two-week therapy is better than one-week therapy, that uh, two times high dose of PPIs are better than two times low dose of PPI, that new generation of PPI is better than old generation of PPI, and, uh, of course, there are two uh, important clinical situations. If you live in a country where H. pylori resistance to claritromycin is under 15%, you may use triple therapies for two weeks. If you live in a country where uh, a resistance rate is higher than 15%, you must go for concomitant two-week therapy or bismuth, at least 10-day uh, therapy to be successful. Put it in another way, Maastricht 5 uh, diagram. So if you start with a triple therapy and you don't succeed, the second line should be bismuth quadruple. If you start with bismuth quadruple because you live like in Russia in a country with high clitromycin resistance, uh, then uh, the second line should be levofloxacin-based triple therapy. Um, if you will have a lot of money, we will start with a third-line approach immediately, so so-called tailored therapy, to look for the resistance and to treat accordingly to the susceptibility of the helicobacter to antibiotics. But because of cost-benefit approach, we put also in Maastricht 5 that option on the third place. So if you fail twice, then you must go uh, uh, according to the results of the culture. Here I borrowed two slides from um, European HP registry and uh, a lot of, or even some uh, of physicians that are here in the audience, uh, we took part from the beginning in that, in that registry. This slide from Javier is a little bit oversimplified because he said that triple therapy is of no good because uh, the eradication here is much lower than 80%. But if you will stratify those data according to different countries in Europe, you will find some countries where triple therapy is sufficient up to 90% or even more, like in Germany, like in Slovenia. So uh, no one therapy fits all. But uh, in general, 
if you use concomitant or bismuth-based therapies, the eradication uh, rate is the highest. That are results from our registry. What about bismuth? We move more and more toward, towards bismuth therapy. And you see here very, very good uh, study by David Graham, group from Houston, from Texas. And he uh, here explains what is the additional effect of adding bismuth to the triple therapy. So you see on the left part of that, uh, that graph that if the rate of resistance is low, then the adding effect of bismuth is low. But on the right side, you see if the resistance uh, to clarithromycin, for example, is high, then bismuth can add up to 40% in eradication success rate. There are different curves for Asian and for European countries because of a different percentage of rapid metabolizers in the community. Here is a very colorful set of, uh, set of figures. And um, in the registry, uh, that will be in a publication that was, the manuscript was sent out, and you see that in central and in northern part of Europe, the second and the third slide is a lot of blue color. It means triple therapy. And in other parts of the Europe, you see more purple and dark purple colors. It means uh, specialists in those countries use more and more bismuth quadruple therapies. And in the lower set of uh, slides, you see in um, red color, uh, the duration of the therapy just seven days, in the orange color 10 days, and in green color 14 days. And you see a trend from 2013 to 2018, more and more therapy is prescribed for two weeks, or at least for uh, 10 days. Let's move to the gastric cancer. That is a problem that has not been solved yet. I mean, the um, prevention strategies in gastric cancer. It is still on the fifth place, by mortality on the third place. Five-year survival in Europe is uh, around 25%, and we see more than 1 million cases per year, new cases per year, and almost 800,000 of those patients will die. We may think that, okay, it's not so uh, our problem, it's more a problem in China, Taiwan, or Korea, or Japan, but it's not true. You see, they are on the first place, but Eastern Europe is on the second place. We are in front of uh, South uh, America and some other parts, so it is an, our problem, and we should do something about it. We know that 15.7% of all cancers attributable to chronic infection diseases. So those cancers are potentially preventable cancers. In underdeveloped world, those cancers are somehow divided to thirds, H. pylori, human papilloma virus, B and C hepatitis. But on the right side, in the developed part of the world, a little bit more than 50% of all cancers uh, that are caused by the chronic infection, are caused by the H. pylori infections and represent gastric cancer. So a huge uh, amount of patients to whom we can and should do something, but at the moment we are not doing enough, in my opinion. What are the risk factors to develop gastric cancer? On one side, genetic, on the other side, envir environmental, and some other factors that are down there. Genetic listed in the first part, uh, our, uh, 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 the cause of cancer may be in up to maximum 3% of patients. The most important risk factors are genetic polymorphism for innate and adaptive immune response and H. pylori infection. Not all H. pylori um, is the same, but we don't have time to go into detail. Uh, there's some data, but not enough for evidence, proof for uh, the role of Epstein biovirus, especially in cardiac uh, cancers, and among other uh, factors, autoimmune corpus gastritis is the most uh, important. Here you see the uh, cancerous cascade uh, by Playa Correa, published in, uh, in Lancet in 1975. Uh, Professor Correa stated that there is a cascade from chronic gastritis to chronic atrophic gastritis, 
to intestinal metaplasia, to dysplasia, and then to cancer. You see the percentages are going down from 100% of those with chronic active to 1 to 3% with adenocarcinoma. Uh, after 1982, we know that H. pylori is the etiological reason, the main etiological reason for a chronic active gastritis. It is important what type of H. pylori you have. It is important what are your genetic polymorphisms uh, and only those that are infected environmental factors are important, nitrosamines and vitamin C and, uh, and all the other things. It is important to say that when patient had diffuse atrophy or intestinal metaplasia, you cannot find H. pylori anymore. But there are other bacteria from the gastric microbiota, and if you are genetically predisposed for the stronger immune response to the bacteria, those other bacteria will finish that pathway that cascade uh, uh, up to adenocarcinoma. World heterosization, the part uh, Yark from Lyon um, wrote for the first time in 1994 that H. pylori is class one carcinogen. And in 2014, this um, book was published. Marcy took active part uh, at that. And among the conclusions, uh, it's written that 89% of non-cardiac gastric cancer are attributable to H. pylori infection, and that we have now enough studies who have proved that with the uh, eradication of H. pylori, we can change that natural path from infection to the cancer. And uh, some calculations have been done that those preventive actions will be cost benefit. <clears throat> That's a very important slide. Uh, Professor Peter Malfertaner borrowed me uh, the slide, and um, two years or uh, a little bit less, a year and a half from now, G20, the most uh, 20 developed countries in the world, uh, came together in Berlin in Germany, and their uh, president of the National Academies of Science signed a document in which it stated, among others, that it's now time to start to apply the knowledge to prevent the cancers caused by chronic infection. In which way? With a vaccination for B hepatitis, with a vaccination for human papilloma virus, with a treatment of C hepatitis, we now have excellent treatment, triple therapy for C hepatitis. But here is also H. pylori, but we have not done enough in that field. So what can we do to prevent gastric cancer in our communities? Nowadays, maybe except Japan and some parts of Taiwan and some parts of China, we are doing just opportunistic prevention. What does it mean? If patients come to us, we diagnose the infection, we treat the infection. If we find somebody with preneoplastic uh, lesions, we biopsy that patients, we stratify them according to risk, and we surveil those. But that is just the tip of the iceberg. 80% of the population with H. pylori, with precancerous lesions in the population, do not come to our attention because they don't have any problems. So our society, Slovenian Society for Gastroenterology and Hepatology, prepared a program for a primary prevention. What does it mean? To, to search for the, those young infected uh, citizens, not patients, because they are Okay, they are without symptoms, but in fact, they have active chronic gastritis, and to uh, cure them of the infection. With that, we can stop that cascade from Playa Korea. I know that Marxists will say, okay, that's too many patients. We should find those 20% that will benefit the most from, from that approach. But at the moment, we don't, cannot find them, those 20%. And the secondary prevention is even more, more uh, complicated because we have at the moment the best tool, but it's not perfect. It is serologic biopsy, pepsinogen 1, pepsinogen 2, and with some cutoffs, you can try to find in the population those patients that have the uh, most severe perineoplastic lesions in the gastric mucosa. Then you scope them, you biopsy them, you stratify the risk, and you surveil them. It's easy to say, but it's not so easy to, to do it. If you, uh, during endoscopy, see a picture like this, uh, it's almost 100% that this patient will have H. pylori infection. But that picture you can see only in younger patients. It's a, it is chronic nodular antral gastritis. So 
uh, in, in those patients, we would like to do the same as we do for colorectal cancer screening. So uh, under the cover of national health insurance, we will have a central unit uh, and a program council that will uh, take care of the program. And National Institute of Public Health will send invitations to our citizens at the age of 20 or 30, we will decide, maybe at the age of 30, and invite them just to come to their family a practitioner to uh, give, uh, give a blood test for locally val validated serology. Uh, we have data that in uh, our country, maybe at the age of 30, we will have 25% of those that will be positive. But then the second confirmation test would be urea breath test with, with which we can prove that at the moment infection is present. You know about the, about the antibodies we, I've, I've told that before. So then they will receive uh, therapy by their primary care physician. All the data must go in a central unit uh, to control the process and less than 10% will not be cured after the first line therapy and they should go to the uh, gastroenterologist. That, but that is debatable. Maybe also second-line therapy can be delivered by primary care physician. Okay, but what kind of therapy we should use? We should use uh, those drugs, those antibiotics that are not used for other, for other indications because it's a problem with the resistance in the community. So uh, in, if we will do that kind of primary prevention, we should go for PPI, bismuth, oxytetracycline, and metronidazole. Okay. What about if a patient comes to your endoscopy suite and you find that uh, type of lesion? It is diffuse intestinal metaplasia. In that case, uh, patients have already come over the point of no return because we know that when we eradicate H. pylori, the active gastri gastritis will disappear, so the neutrophils will disappear immediately. The mononuclear cellular infiltration will disappear in maybe two years. The atrophy can be partially reversible, but intestinal metaplasia is a point of no return. So when you eradicate H. pylori and you have intestinal metaplasia, that patient is at lower risk for a cancer, but not at zero risk for the cancer. And now we have data that with serologic biopsy, we have a pool sensitivity of 0.7 and a pool specificity of 0.9. So good specificity, not so good sensitivity, so not an ideal test, but with that test, we can find some patients that are at special risk. And we published last year's study, 288 patients uh, in, the, in the 50 to 75 years. So it was our population that come to us from colorectal cancer screening. And we use um, gastropanel in them. And we find 7.3% of those that were gastropanel positive, all gym or all gum more than one. So if you we, if we use that endpoint as the accuracy for perineoplastic lesions, the uh, test was um, uh, has an, a combined accuracy 87.5%. So it is not so bad. But the future is bright, or even the, the today the endoscopy of today is. Uh, brighter and brighter. So you here, you here you see some magnification, magnification pictures when you can magnify for uh, up to 150% and you can say whether you are in corpus, you are in antrum or as, as is in lower right, whether you are in duodenum and whether the epithelia is normal or not. And if we will follow our Japanese friends and if we will learn from them, we have a great um, great uh, endoscopes now to be better at, at uh, diagnosing the early cancers because we are at the moment quite poor comparing to Japanese endoscopists. So uh, when you find a patient with intestinal metaplasia, you should adhere to Sydney protocol and you should take five biopsies in two separate containers, antrum, incisula, angoraeus into one and corpus into another. And your pathologist will, will del, then show you the results in all, whether Olga or Olgim. You must decide what to use. In Slovenia, we decided to go for Olgim that was uh, in, uh, somehow invented, let's say, in Netherlands, because uh, we think that the inter-observer agreement among pathologists is much better for intestinal metaplasia than for atrophy. And if you have patient in the stage three and in stage four, 
you must surveil them. They are at the highest risk for cancer. But we must admit the, that also those in stage one and stage two are not at nil risk for gastric cancer. So that are new data that are coming. And we have now in Europe MAPS guidelines um, uh, that um, says, this, says like this, that you must use the best scopes you have. Ideal is high definition with magnification, with virtual chroma endoscopy. But OK, you can diagnose uh, preneoplastic lesions if you experience, experience endoscopist. And then you must biopsy them according to Sydney protocol. And if the pathology says that uh, metaplasia and atrophy is just in antrum, no need for surveillance. If it is in um, antrum and corpus, you must surveil them every three years. If you have a low-grade dysplasia, it's more difficult uh, situation, but after eradicating H. pylori infection, the dysplasia must, uh, can, low-grade dysplasia can be normalized. If you find high-grade dysplasia, then usually, usually, or you can, you can see some, some changes on the mucosa. You must then uh, resect that changes for definite histopathology uh, uh, result. Otherwise, you must survey them every six six months. Those guidelines will be changed, will be, will be upgraded, but at, at the moment it is the best we have. Do we have any uh, evidence based that that approach I'm suggesting now will have any impact on the survival of those patients? Yes, we have. We have a lot. But um, in, the, in the respect of time, I will show you just four slides. First is that landmark paper. It's an excellent study for me, really excellent, from our Japanese colleagues. They include more than 500 patients hour after endoscopic submucosal uh, dissection for early gastric cancer. Uh, in all of them, they found H. pylori infection. And in double-blind manner, they uh, randomized them to placebo or to eradication therapy. And uh, this study was... Um, uh, at, at, the, at the beginning uh, was planned to be for seven years, but at, at the year, at the th end of the third year, they broke the code and they wanted to know what is going on because they have been seeing uh, patients that came back with a, with a new, uh, with a metachronos early gastric cancer because they were in endoscopic surveillance. And when they broke the code, they see the red line and that purple line. And what do you think, uh, which patients were those in the red line, which patients were those in purple line uh, regarding the H. pylori infection? What do you think? <coughs> what? <coughs> those uh, that were not eradicated were in red line. Those that were eradicated were in purple line. And the difference were highly statistically significant. Uh, after that study, the Japanese Society for H. pylori completely change their recommendations and they need another four years to persuade the health insurance to start with a mass eradication program that is nowadays in place in Japan. Uh, here's the last meta-analysis from uh, Professor Sugano, the leader of the uh, Japanese society, um, also the first author of the Kyoto Consensus. And in meta-analysis, they, they say at the end that the, that the, the after eradication, the odds ratio for gastric cancer in those eradicated is 0 0.46. The, the 95 confidence interval is quite narrow, so it's very strong evidence. And uh, when you look uh, carefully to those two studies, you see that a lot of patients in those studies were older, with preneoplastic lesions already present in the stomach. So if you'll, you will do the eradication before, okay, we don't have the evidence now, but we can realistically thought that that odds ratio will be much, much lower than it is in this population, but it's still a an, an very, uh, uh, very important result. Here you see the, the uh, gastric cancer-related deaths in Japan, and you see that the curve started to decline somewhere in the year 2011-12. So, of course, there are multiple factors why it so, uh, because they are excellent in, in uh, surveillance of those patients. 
they found a lot of early cancers and five years survival is more than 80% in those group of patients. So, of, of course, one of the reasons is their, their excellent endoscopy, but they are doing the screening and surveillance, endoscopic surveillance for many, many years or decades. But what happened in the 213, their natural health insurance started to pay the helicobacter eradication treatment for everybody. And from that year, 2013, they eradicated 1.5 million patients each year. And Professor Sugano, you know, Dmitry uh, Marsis, showed the prediction of that curve, and he said in 20 or 30 years, we will not have a problem with gastric cancer in Japan anymore. And with that slides, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. You want me to start? Yeah. Although I'm not that much of a helicobacter expert. We did a population-based study in, in the region where I come from, in northeastern Germany. And uh, we found an incidence between 28 and 40 percent of the population. This is East Germany, so the rates are higher uh, than in yeah, West, West, West Germany. Uh, and the interesting observation, and depending on age group, the, the, the older the, 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 the proband, they were all volunteers. The older they were, um, the higher the rate. What was interesting, because we had follow-up data from five and ten years, we found that someone um, who had Helicobacter pylori uh, infection was likely they lost Helicobacter pylori at a rate between 2 and 3 percent a year. And the other question is, do you acquire Helicobacter pylori during your life? Yes, a very small proportion, 0.1 percent maybe. It's very, very low. So that's, this confirms what you say. It depends on what hygienic conditions you live early in life. But a very high proportion, a proportion higher than you could with any eradication program, lose Helicobacter pylori by different mechanisms. Either they develop atrophic gastritis and Helicobacter is no longer there, or they get antibiotics or PPIs for any other reason, and this is when they lose it. Um, I can agree with you, and I think the data from Japan are quite convincing as to secondary prevention of gastric cancer. So if you have an early lesion and you are Helicobacter pylori positive, if you eradicate it, you reduce the chances by half, no more, by half, of then later developing another either premalignant lesion or cancer. However, my problem with your proposition is the following. If you would do this on a population-wide level, in Germany alone, you would have to eradicate between 20 and 30 million people. You would create a massive problem with resistance nationwide, population-wide. And the incidence of gastric cancer is five times lower in Germany than it is in Japan. And to me, at this point in time, there is no evidence whatsoever that you can reduce the incident with primary prevention, not secondary prevention, that this would translate into a such significant reduction that it's worth the cost, worth the antibiotic resistance, worth the other symptoms you would create. We have, we've been discussing this for colon cancer, which is five times, uh, eight times more prevalent in Germany than gastric cancer. And Jaroslav Regula was involved in some of the studies. It was very, it took more than 15 years to show that you have a disease-specific reduction in mortality. And we're still struggling to show a population-wide reduction in mortality for colorectal cancer. For colorectal cancer. And I think this would be nearly impossible for gastric cancer to show. Thank you. Thank you very much for a lot of comments, so I don't know where to start, but I will try to. So, for the secondary prevention, there is a meta-analysis published in PLOS One, and the odds ratio was 0 0.38. So it's even more than one uh, half of the reduction yeah. of the risk. That's for the secondary prevention. For the primary prevention, the data are not out yet. There are some studies going on in China, 
but we will have to wait for 10 years or even more to, to receive the results. There is one study, you know, you know it for sure from Wonk, but mm -hmm. it was just a uh, um, sub-analysis of those patients that were eradicated without perineoplastic lesions in the time span of seven and a half years, they didn't develop cancer. Those with the perineoplastic lesions, some of them developed cancer. So mm -hmm. it, it's not a proper study, but mm -hmm. it, it is some, let's say, some, some direction. Um, regarding the primary prevention, theoretically, it would be the best. Of course. It would be the best, because we will not just prevent gastric cancer, but we can prevent in that group of patients also gastric, a part of gastric ulcers mm -hmm. and duodenal ulcers, let's say mult lymphoma that's very rare or, or some other rare uh, diseases caused by H. pylori. Theoretically, it is cause benefit because the analysis, the studies have been done that all, also in countries with low gastric cancer incidence like United States, mm -hmm. it will be cause benefit. It is. That are studies by Julia Personnel and, mm. so, and some others. But of course, that will, that will mean a tremendous use of antibiotics in the population. Mm. I, I agree completely. There's no resistance on, on bismuth. Mm -hmm. Oxytetracycline maybe is also not so important. Metronidazole, there are relative resistance to metronidazole according to the dose you use and the duration of treatment you have. So maybe. There are some problems, but not uh, absolute problems, not a wall that in front of which we can, we can stop. I, I just, for the end, has one comment. We have now sent a manuscript for the publication for colorectal cancer mm -hmm. screening. Uh, in Slovenia now, we are 10 years of colorectal cancer. Mm -hmm. We started in 2009, national wide two-step fit and mm -hmm. endoscopy. And um, I prepared a uh, uh, date data for first six years. Mm -hmm. And it is significant reduction of the incidence of colorectal cancer in the population, 12 per 100,000 less per year. The, um, the, the diminishing of the gastric cancer incidence is statistically significant and more important in men than in women. In women didn't reach statistical significance, but is a drop. And what is also important, I mean, uh, the five-year survival for those with colorectal cancers found in, in a screening program is 31% better than those colorectal cancers that were found out outside the program. So I think we already have some data in six-year time that this program reduced the incidence of the cancer. For the, for the gastric cancer, of course, uh, a program with, of primary prevention We'll need uh, 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 maybe 20 years to prove to be, to be effective and to reduce the burden. But Japanese have start. I think it's a good start because also they eradicate uh, uh, H. pylori in asymptomatic people if they are diagnosed with H. pylori and 1.5 million per year. So I think we should follow. But of course, you're right, not everywhere. There are limits. Maybe Marxists will point at the limits. So it, it is an approach that is, I, mean, I think, very good for the countries with high incidence of gastric cancer or maybe for countries with medium incidence of gastric cancer mm -hmm. that mean uh, in figures 20 or more new cases per 100,000. <coughs> and of course, it is not wise to do it in, in Africa or maybe in, in South America because of sanitation, because the reinfection rate may be 15 or 20 percent in a year. In, in, in our population, I've studied that, the reinfection rate is 0.1 percent per year. And we are well aware of, of, uh, about the problem of resistance, and now we are starting with a, with a prospective study when we will evaluate the influence of that uh, bismuth therapy and triple therapy on the microbiome, on the change on uh, the possible reversibility of microbiome in a follow-up of one year. And we will especially, with shotgun sequencing, look at the resistome uh, after the treatment. So maybe in a two, three year time, I can give you some more data about it. Okay. A very hot topic. I think we have to move to Martin's uh, speech about limitation of 
Education. Okay, thank you and good morning everybody. Thanks organizers, thanks my friend Boyan and actually both of you for setting a very good stage already for, for my presentation. And actually I had a dilemma yesterday night whether to speak in a pure Russian language uh, or, or maybe in a bit better English language, but since I haven't been giving my slides to the interpreters, so maybe that they would also have a problem. So I will really try to show the slides in English and switch then to Russian instead. I will try to speak Russian. My subject is problems that can be associated with the eradication therapy for H. pylori. And we have already heard a lot uh, about uh, the guidelines uh, which recommend not only to eradicate uh, the bacterium to all, but they uh, even recommend to look for people who have helicobacter. Uh, especially in the healthy population without any symptoms. Uh, why doesn't it happen in reality? And a year ago in this hall there was a talk, uh, data were shown that uh, in Russia almost half of the doctors do not agree to eradicate the bacterium in themselves. So that's why what kind of recommendations can be given by these doctors to patients? And a week ago, I heard a television broadcast where a famous professor, gastroenterologist, said, no, there is no need in eradicating uh, helicobacter if there is no ulcer. So um, that's why my objective is to try and uh, find... Uh, uh, and find the division between the wrong interpretation of the data that we have and those problems that we can have in case of mass eradication. And this television broadcast showed that those who will eradicate Helicobacter will uh, have uh, a reflux, reflux disease, a Barrett esophagus a carcinoma, uh, diarrhea, I don't know. Uh, it, well, it was shown as travelers' diarrhea. Also, it will uh, pr uh, give way to asthma, atomic dermatitis, and weight increase. What are we to do with this data? What uh, should we account for? Where can we find pros and cons of the problem? I have uh, selected uh, some results of the studies. We have a lot of data, but the question arises about the quality of data and interpretation of data. And we know that there are negative associations between allergies, asthma, and helicobacter. The same association exists between the reflux uh, disease, helicobacter, and uh, BE, and adenocarcinoma of esophagus. But uh, if these associations exist, uh, but is the relationship uh, between this phenomena in reality? The, so, that is a great issue. Epidemiology does not always reflect the relationship between this uh, phenomena. I would like to draw your attention to the basic uh, problems because we do not have evidence that there is a causal relationship, but we may look at the mechanisms and the subtle things that can give this relationship. And we know that after H. pylori eradication, we may improve the situation with atrophic gastritis, uh, with the intestinal metaplasia, atrophic gastritis, we can also improve secretion of the stomach, and possibly there is a relationship with the reflux disease. So the uh, 
not the disease itself, but the manifestation of symptoms. Uh, another mechanism that we may have, uh, it can also affect uh, the changes in appetite and weight. It can go through the ghrelin mechanism. Ghrelin is produced uh, in the stomach, and there are two forms. Uh, uh, and uh, in atrophy, the uh, level of active uh, ghrelin is reduced. Uh, some uh, trial, uh, ghrelin is one of the parameters that is recommended to study in defining the astroph astrophic gastritis. Uh, so some studies uh, compare the level of ghrelin uh, in ulcer and gastritis, and it was reduced uh, in gastritis and uh, uh, elevated in uh, ulcer. There is evidence that in progressing of atrophic gastritis, the level of ghrelin is reducing. So what is happening after HP uh, eradication? And it turned out that shortly after eradication, the level of ghrelin uh, further drops. If it elevated, uh, we could uh, uh, think that probably the appetite uh, is improving and the person takes more food, and that's why the ghrelin is increasing and the weight is increasing. But we must say that this, uh, th this data are contradictory. Not all studies show the same results. That's why we need to research it further. But it could be one of the mechanisms of weight growth after eradication therapy. But it hasn't yet been proven, finally. Uh, another problem that has been already mentioned is, uh, is the increased consumption of antibiotics. If we provide eradication therapy in the regions where the infection level is high, we may increase the overall consumption of antibiotics, and which is even more important, of those antibiotics that are used for uh, the uh, treatment of serious diseases. It has been mentioned that we may increase the bacteria that are resistant. We speak not only about uh, uh, HP. The HP resistance is increasing, but we are much more concerned about the resistance of other bacteria uh, of uh, GIT and uh, the resp resp respiratory system. And uh, so again, there are very contradictory opinions. It is considered that the use of antibiotics for a short period of time, once in a lifetime, will not affect the general intake of antibiotics because, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, children, uh, uh, people start taking antibiotics from the early childhood. That's why a uh, uh, one-time uh, course will not uh, change uh, many things. But before we uh, undertake it, I would like to show the slide that was uh, calculated by some, organ some organizations like H WHO. What are the main causes for death in 2050? And one of the main reasons will be antimicrobial resistance. The num the mortality caused by malignant diseases will be lower than the death caused by uh, microbial resistance. And we may also calculate what part of all malignant diseases is taken by the gastric cancer. A very, very low part, a very, very low share. After antibiotic uh, treatment, we have much data in a short, in a sh shortly after the antibiotic treatment, uh, the intestinal flora changes uh, dramatically. 
uh, and uh, it is considered to be normal uh, up to six months uh, after uh, eradication. Then microflora returns uh, to its uh, initial condition. However, we uh, have uh, more and more data testifying that uh, uh, the courses are taken for eradication therapy, and this is one of the latest publication where molecular, molecular methods uh, were used. The preliminary studies have been based on bacterial methods that healthy people, if they uh, get the eradication therapy, even after 12 and 18 months, uh, a part of them will have uh, a different uh, uh, microflora compared with that they had before eradication. Moreover, if we take into account antibiotics that we use, and claritromycin and metronidazole are the most harmful in this respect, and they induce resistance of microorganisms. The previous data, part of them are from the uh, uh, Karolinsky group. The patients were followed up after eradication therapy uh, from one year to four years. The data indicated that the resistance of staphylococci, streptococci, uh, enterococcus uh, in this period uh, was observed. That's why uh, the selection of resistant uh, strains uh, is uh, taking place. This is uh, one of the landmark publications uh, that were published 10 years ago and using the bacteriological uh, methods. And that was a uh, there were volunteers who for seven days were treated by macrolids, azithromycin, clarithromycin, and the placebo group. Uh, they were followed uh, for 180 days, and uh, it showed resistance of microbial who received macrolids. So what do we have in our guidelines? Uh, this uh, data were about a seven-day therapy, but we prolong uh, the periods, uh, the duration of uh, therapy, not only in Europe. The same is in Canadian guidelines. We recommend even 14 days if it is no, uh, efficacy is uh, of the shorter course is not proven. And. Uh, and uh, uh, resistant, resistance of microorganisms is increasing with the use of antibiotics uh, for the treatment of in the food industry. And if we treat uh, the, our patients uh, for a too short period of time, it is also bad because uh, we end up with um, cultivation of uh, resistance in those uh, pathogens not killed after these antibiotics. And day by day, we increase the risks of uh, proliferation of resistance isolates. Um, resistance strains. I'm going to show you the theoretical examples of antibiotics use, namely use of antibiotics in the countries of the European Union in Latvia is shown here and it belongs to the countries where antibiotics are not so widely used compared to the other countries. And as long as we plan for eradication therapy uh, we imply the antibiotic use of chloretromycin and penicillins in Latvia in, during the period of two to three years. And this is the growth we expect in a normal condition as it is 
as it is currently. If we go for eradication therapy only in those young men that uh, reached 18 years of age, only for one year, regardless of what age the antibiotics are given, the real use of antibiotics is increased by two folds. So initially there were two uh, definite doses, but when we start treatment of those uh, young men, we double the use of antibiotics in the country. But if we decide to widen the scope of antibiotic prophylaxis, even uh, for a shorter period, uh, less than one year, taking it into account that not all the people will really take antibiotics, then the overall use of antibiotics will be increased by four folds, including all in antibiotics, um, penicillins, erythromycin, and macrolids. Or even higher increase, up to sixfold. One should not think that uh, this is a harmless use of antibiotics that would have no effect on overall antibiotics use um, at the country level. Similar examples have already been uh, demonstrated uh, during screening and treatment of chlamydia infection. But we need to take into account that chlamydia is much less prevalent than helicobacter and the practical uh, solutions of antibiotic uh, prophylaxis is not feasible in this case. A few words about the efficacy of treatment. It's been mentioned already that uh, there are at least three meta-analyses confirming the efficacy of helicobacter eradication at the state level. But what should be taken into account as well that uh, was not, uh, the, namely the expenses uh, to uh, develop the resistance. It was not possible to estimate uh, this factor, but only recently, very recently, uh, these uh, estimations have been published. And uh, the price for one uh, resistant case is evaluated at a uh, higher scale, at a very huge range uh, from five to thousand dollars per patient. That's why it is very hard to c calculate precisely. And uh, a recent paper to demonstrate the real cost of resistance was done in the United States. Of course, it cannot be even compared to uh, our realities, but the overall cost of each and every prescribed antibiotic, including hidden costs, is as high as $13. And this is uh, the real gain in the overall expenses and additional burden for the healthcare system. With that, I would like to finish my presentation concluding that we should treat um, those patients infected with helicobacter. And I'm, I pretty I'm pretty sure and I agree that these are worth being treated. But on the other hand, we should also agree with the point, despite all the controversies, that uh, for prophylaxis, it is most likely we need to use antibiotics other than those currently used for symptomatic patients. Unfortunately, we do not have enough evidence on which age groups should antibiotics be prescribed in, and uh, should it be at uh, family planning uh, time of life, 
in order not to transfer helicobacter vertically. There is also a, a theoretical approach to expand the prophylaxis programs in these patients' cohorts, if indicated. But in this case, we can also get uh, this recommendation as uh, guidelines. Uh, unfortunately, it is not always feasible from the practical point. Thank you very much, dear Martos. As we can see, uh, there are different points even within our experts. On one hand, uh, uh, gastric cancer should be based on eradication of helicobacter because 90 percent of gastric cancer is caused by helicobacter infection but only in three percent of those infected with helicobacter will develop gastric cancer this approach does work in japan because of higher prevalence of gastric cancer generally speaking maybe in europe we should follow some milder practices but uh, let us uh, uh, get back to our colleagues. Uh, we, I would quite interested of uh, your point. I have a little remark. This is actually the bridge to the personalized medicine uh, aiming at uh, the patients in the general population, those who have higher risks of the gastric cancer and either infected with helicobacter pylori or <clears throat> uh, infected with Epstein-Barr virus. Uh, our morning's session was started with a wonderful uh, presentation that uh, convincingly demonstrated uh, how the prophylaxis programs could be implemented and what they give to the patients and to the doctors. Uh, those factors associated with helicobacter pylori resulted in uh, quite a number of consensuses, including a Russian consensus recently published. Each and every of these consensuses has different levels of evidence uh, and it is based on the experts opinion and uh, on the randomized controlled trials and meta-analysis. Actually these consensuses are to illustrate the final word if I may say so uh, to formulate uh, the real uh, guidelines in order that these guidelines are implemented in our everyday life uh, we need to have a good organizational level of the healthcare system enabling these programs to be implemented and we all know that whatever good the drug is it will not work if the patient doesn't take it or even if it is not prescribed uh, to the patient after analyzing all the available information and formulation of the experts' opinion, we need to communicate uh, these views to our uh, practitioners. But the question is whether our doctors agree uh, to those guidelines. On one hand, we have problems with patients' compliance, uh, that sometimes the patients are not uh, quite convinced they are to uh, go through all these uh, diagnostic steps. But there is also the flip side of the coin. Uh, this is the prevalence of helicobacter pylori among physicians. Recently, um, Professor Bordin and his colleagues conducted a study showing a high level of infection amongst the physicians. And only 50% of those who are positive for helicobacter are eager to be uh, eradicated. Let's take a look. Out of 619 infected physicians, only 117 uh, were treated with antibiotics. Uh, this is about 19%. Of the efficacy rate was 16% also. 
only. And uh, but if all the doctors would agree that uh, when being infected, one needs to be eradicated from Helicobacter or at least be diagnosed or excluded from the conditions associated with Helicobacter, we also also see a quite low rate of eradication amongst the physicians, showing that the physician's compliance rate is also very low. That is to elaborate this study of anonymous questioning, questioning of, of the doctors who are associated, infected with helicobacter, sorry, not doctors, but uh, patients above 18 years of age. Uh, they uh, expressed their attitude uh, or being consent uh, with the, the uh, proposal to be eradicated. Uh, as many as 458 uh, doctors were um, question, questioned and the uh, age distribution is uh, quite uh, uh, typical from 22 to 81 years. Most of the Participants were internal uh, internists, uh, and uh, most of them had uh, uh, certifications of gastroenterologists. The indications for eradication of Helicobacter pylori, the consent level and compliance level of uh, the doctors uh, in the family members and close relatives of the patients, uh, the compliance rate is quite high, about 85 percent. But as for peptic ulcer uh, that draws attention of Maastricht uh, consensus uh, since uh, the second edition, the compliance rate uh, is much lower, about 54 uh, percent only. Multivariate analysis was done to analyze all these factors, and uh, there was quite a, a big range in the responses we observed. Nearly all the gastroenterologists agree that eradication should be done in case of exacerbation of the uh, peptic ulcers, but about 20 percent of our therapists just do not agree to the point that the patients should be recommended eradication during remission of peptic ulcers. Also very interesting results uh, related to functional dyspepsia uh, after non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs. Almost all the gastroenterologists agree that uh, helicobacter should be eradicated if uh, there is a peptic ulcer, especially those who take uh, NSAIDs for a long time. But on the other hand, the therapists in 30 percent of cases do not agree uh, that it should be recommended to eradicate helicobacter in case of functional dyspepsia. And non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs uh, resulted in even higher disagreement. But uh, the general uh, GPs are the first, actually, the first level of medical care that should follow uh, uh, this recommendation uh, um, thoroughly. The poor compliance level uh, is also seen at the international level. Back in 1990s, uh, uh, in case of Helicobacter was revealed, only 35 percent of them recommended the patients to eradicate the pathogen. As for the functional dyspepsia, I would like to refer to the uh, Ireland Irish study published in 1996 that only half percent of the patients ended up with uh, helicobacter eradication as prescribed by the doctors. And only 40 percent of doctors uh, during the uh, later uh, study mostly GPs considered the patients uh, should be actively revealed for helicobacter in case of positivity. I would like to emphasize once again the need for eradication therapy, especially in patients uh, treated uh, with uh, 
uh, PPIs for a long time. Those are usually comorbid patients uh, having high risk of gastroduodenal bleedings. Uh, and these are patients treated with antiplatelets, uh, dual antiplatelet agents. And let's take a look at the international experience. These are data published back in um, 2016. 188 doctors, GPs were um, questioned, and only 66% thought of uh, need to eradicate uh, helicobacter. In functional dyspepsia, 55 with uh, family uh, history of uh, gastric cancer. I mean that we need to improve uh, the awareness amongst uh, the doctors for them to advocate the eradication approach. Since uh, Maastricht 4, uh, it is the factor of uh, duration of PPI's treatment, showing that helicobacter should be actively sought in uh, patients uh, on PPI's. Of course, uh, primary diagnostic methods of helicobacter pylori uh, is quite uh, different. Uh, those patients having uh, dyspepsia should undergo endoscopic exam, but uh, it should be uh, together with um, a biopsy and a histological uh, test uh, of the uh, specimen. Urease test is uh, not sufficient in most of the cases. The compliance rate uh, for active use of this method is quite low and not higher than 60 percent. Uh, multivariate analysis was also performed in order to understand uh, what opinion uh, uh, GPs uh, have. And it looks like GPs uh, do not agree mostly with uh, active use of uh, the breath test, urease test, as a method of primary diagnostics. The efficacy of primary in diagnostics is influenced by poor availability of bismuth agents uh, as well as poor compliance with uh, PPI uh, regimens. Let's take a look at the uh, compliance level amongst doctors. Uh, this is uh, a very uh, troublesome statistics. We need to take into account that PPIs are emphasized by very few doctors despite the present helicobacter infection. But we need to understand that if a patient is on PPIs, the probability to reveal helicobacter is reduced dramatically. More than 400 cases were analyzed in a couple of gastroenterological centers. Uh, Helicobacter pylori was diagnosed using histobacterioscopy. The negative results were observed in most patients uh, treated with PPIs. And this is a real uh, condition. If the patient is not eradicated, it is mostly due to the false uh, negative results of the bacteriological tests the choice of eradication method. We should base our tactics on the uh, susceptibility of the pathogen. And in Novosibirsk, we conducted a study demonstrating that the uh, resistance uh, prevalence is 6% uh, to chlorithromycin in standard antibiotic uh, treatment uh, results in good compliance, generally speaking. So the PPI, claritromycin, amoxicillin plus vismut, the level of consent was maximal, 80%. As to quadruple uh, therapy with tetracycline, it was only a 30% consent. And it is explained by the fact that the uh, prescription of tetracycline, it is 100 milligrams. Uh, yeah, it is so it's specified by the number of uh, pills uh, that the patient uh, have uh, to take. The chase of eradication therapy, uh, both gastroenterologists and therapists agree that the most effective uh, uh, therapy 
is uh, standard, uh, supplemented by bismuth, and uh, they quite uh, uh, the experts quite openly demonstrated their position uh, of doubt and disagreement as uh, to the consecutive therapy. We understand today that bismuth, as the uh, component of therapy, allows us uh, to raise uh, uh, results. Its uh, tolerability is quite good, and uh, it is uh, preserved uh, uh, for a long time, and uh, the, uh, it uh, ensures uh, compliance of uh, patients. Uh, we have uh, 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 generic of bismuth today, which is quite affordable to our patients and can be uh, prescribed as a component of uh, the therapy. So, uh, specific features of the eradication therapy, what can raise its uh, efficacy? It is the use of double uh, uh, P PPI doses and uh, the um, uh, addition of the drug that doesn't depend on the polymorphism, uh, and uh, we need to uh, expect uh, that emoprazole and rabaprazole are to be used. And here our doctors agree with this, uh, pros, uh, this um, in 80% of cases. But as to double doses of PPI, only 30% fully agree with uh, this uh, approach. This is the situation. Is, uh, this situation is to be analyzed, and we need to raise uh, the uh, level of extent uh, of uh, consent. Yeah. As to gastrologists and therapists, look, the use of double doses of PPI inhibitors. So the um, primary care doctors and therapists expressed uh, doubt, uh, most of all, and we need to explain to them the essence of the method, and that will help us uh, eradicate Helicobacter on on a higher level. So we need to remember uh, the statements made in the guidelines. The meta-analysis uh, demonstrated the choice of omeprazole and rabeprazole as components of the eradication therapy. And we understand that the prescription of these uh, uh, drugs raises the efficacy of therapy. If the efficacy is, ra uh, is uh, normal, then we avoid the necessity of uh, further courses. And that uh, helps us uh, combat the resistance. We need uh, to, I would like to say that now we have affordable drugs, uh, drugs safe, uh, um, effective, Zulbix, Rabaprazole, and others. Here, the, uh, our patients have a lot of opportunities uh, as to the duration of their education therapy, seven days and 14 days course. If a year ago we uh, made a survey of uh, primary care doctors and 40 percent agreed only with the therapy for 14 days. Now, for this year, the situation has improved, and we see that most therapists and all gastroenterologists that were surveyed agree that it is to, that, uh, to recommend a 14-day uh, therapy is uh, much more effective. The control of HP uh, eradication. We have very interesting data in this respect. Uh, so everybody agrees uh, that uh, the uh, helicobacter pallor eradication is to be controlled. Uh, uh, but 85% uh, agreed with the fact that the test is to be not earlier than a month after the therapy is completed. What are the methods of uh, control uh, are used? What uh, our, our doctors are uh, uh, going to prescribe? Uh, first of all, it is a uh, uh, histo uh, uh, endoscopic uh, uh, test. 
but we do not always do it. If it is required, if the uh, patient has some uh, ulcer-like uh, defects uh, of the mucus, and these patients will be controlled. But what will happen to other patients? What method uh, can be used uh, to can be used uh, by our doctors. Uh, the level of consent, the level of agreement as to non-invasive tests, uh, uh, so only 64% uh, agreed uh, with the urea breath test. Uh, what uh, prevents us uh, from uh, complying with the HP uh, uh, eradication guidelines? both international and Russian. You know, of course, our therapists have a flow of information, and they are well familiar with the key uh, statements uh, of international consensus and uh, uh, guidelines. But what prevents them from complying with them? First of all, the deficit of time for therapists. Gastroenterologists said that that's, this problem doesn't exist for them. We expected that probably there is not enough efficacy and safety uh, in the treatment. No, everything is okay here. But there are a lot of complaints about endoscopists uh, who do not always comply with the protocol and low adherence of patients. Uh, so the doctors uh, assess their own adherence as high. As to the patients, uh, the adherence is only uh, uh, is uh, quite low, and 55% of those surveyed that that uh, low adherence uh, prevents uh, from complying with the protocols. But if the doctor is not sure that he is right, if he doesn't recommend the uh, relevant strategy, you cannot expect a good uh, compliance from the patients. That's why compliance of uh, doctors is one of the uh, components of the strategy that le must lead to the effective introduction of clinical guidelines uh, in the real practice. Uh, of course, uh, we need a good system of health care, uh, a proper monitoring of sensitivity and stability of the HP infection. Of course, we need uh, to work on the adherence or the uh, compliance of patients, but the most important thing is the com adherence of the doctors because it is very important uh, the way they relay this information to the patients. Uh, thank you, Marina Atolievna. We see that uh, uh, we still need uh, to agree between ourselves, uh, and uh, there are a lot of things uh, to do with our doctors. This, uh, re uh, you know, our recommendations uh, must be very, very reasonable. We have some doubts. Doctors have some doubts. We need to remove doubts. We are beyond the schedule. That's why we have to finish the schedule. And now uh, the. We have the surgeon that will take part uh, in the next session.